God is in his holy place, God who dwells, who unites those who dwell in his house. He himself gives might and strength to his people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You are sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. O oh God, protector of those who hope in you, without whom nothing has firm foundation, nothing is holy. Bestow in abundance your mercy upon us, and grant that with you as our ruler and guide, we may use the good things that pass in such a way as to hold fast even now to those that ever endure. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Let my eyes stream with tears, day and night without rest, over the great destruction which overwhelms the virgin daughter of my people, over her incurable wound. If I walk out into the field, look, those slain by the sword, if I enter the city, look, those consumed by hunger. Even the prophet and the priest forage in a land they know not. Have you cast Judah off completely? Is Zion loathsome to you? Why have you struck us a blow that cannot be healed? We wait for peace to no avail. For a time of healing, but terror comes instead. We recognize, O oh Lord, our wickedness, the guilt of our fathers, that we have sinned against you. For your name's sake, spurn us not. Disgrace not the throne of your glory. Remember your covenant with us and break it not. Among the nation's idols, is there any that gives rain? Or can the mere heavens send showers? Is it not you alone, O Lord, our God, to whom we look? You alone have done all these things. The word of the Lord. For the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us. Your name, O Lord, deliver us. Remember not against us the inequities of the past. May your compassion quickly come to us, for we are brought very low. For the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us. Help us, O God, our Savior, because of the glory of your name. Deliver us and pardon our sins for your name's sake. For the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us. Let the prisoners sighing come before you. With your great power, free those doomed to death. Then we, your people, and the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. Through all generations, we will declare your praise. For the glory of your name, O Lord, deliver us.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus dismissed the crowds and went into his house. His disciples approached him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He said in reply, He who sows good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, the good seed is the the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Just as weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all who cause others to sin and all evildoers. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears ought to hear. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. One of the big changes that happened in human history um, was the Enlightenment, and it's this era, you know, that's how they call themselves, uh, people who are in the Enlightenment. Enlightened mean, means to be like, um, all of a sudden we were in darkness, which was the Dark Ages, and then all of a sudden we're in the Enlightenment. It's some, such a better era because we're now a lot smarter than we were previously. That's the, what the people from the Enlightenment would think. And one of the, the several, every age has this, you know, and so it's really an interesting question to ask, what are the, the myths that you tell yourself? But one of the myths of the Enlightenment um, that they thought about themselves was that um, because they had, were using human reason for the first time, um, and, you know, the medieval people were just so backwards and dark and superstitious and everything, we can create such a better world using human reason that we might be able to end human suffering, um, you know, end corrupt governments, um, you know, end war even, um, just all these great things. And so um, actually, believe it or not, we, we can almost in a moment point out to the moment when uh, the Enlightenment ended. And the Enlightenment ended as soon as people discovered um, what happened to the Jews in World War II. And there have been, you know, genocides throughout human history. There have been terrible human acts. But the thing was is that it, this was not just any genocide. This was the German people. You know, I don't want to say the German people, but um, many of the Germans who did this. And the reason why that was so shocking was that the Germans were the most advanced civilization in the world at the time. Um, you know, technologically, um, intellectually, I mean, some of the greatest philosophers of the last, you know, 150 years came out of, uh, of Germany. Um, just culturally speaking, everything about Germany just, you know, put, held them up as just the paradigm of humanity and, um, at that particular time. And then when you turn around and you see what happened, uh, all of a sudden you start to think, well, I thought we were making progress, but this looks awfully brutal. This does not look like progress to me. And quite frankly, when everybody saw that, you can say at that moment is that there was an end to the period of the Enlightenment. And so what ends up happening, I think, is when you start looking at something like um, World War I and World War II and how awful both those things were and the atrocities that governments have committed against people throughout the 20th century, and then you go back and you look at um, our first reading and what's going on in Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, basically this uh, gospel, or this, the, the reading is where the city of Jerusalem is under siege. Um, and I don't know if you've ever like tried to imagine yourself under siege. So basically your city walls are surrounded and there's no like helicopters airdropping in supplies and things like that. And, and basically they're trying to um, squeeze you out uh, by draining you of resources. And um, you know, things got really, really desperate. I'm not going to say how desperate, because I've already mentioned the Holocaust and genocide in a homily before, but, um, you know, just imagine when you start running out of food, like, how do you start to feed yourself? And, like, if you start to use your imagination, you realize just how bad things had gotten. And then what ends up happening, and what's even worse, is that the Jewish people then at that point, they, um, th the city of Jerusalem was like 
their gift to God. Like you read the scriptures and they talk about Jerusalem, you talk about the, the kings of Israel. I mean, these things are being promised to them by God. And they are then, uh, the city of Jerusalem is then burned to the ground along with the temple and you know their king is dethroned and all the people who were promised the promised land are then um, taken and put into exile in Babylon. So not only did they have really bad things happen, which happens all throughout human history, this was extra tragic because they thought in that moment that it, they had certain signs that they had been abandoned by God. Now, of course, we know that that last part's not true, that they weren't actually abandoned by God, and those remained faithful. Seventy years later, they were miraculously, when the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire, um, the Persians just said to them, hey, why don't you take all of your sacred vessels, which the Babylonians stole, and why don't you just go back home? I mean, kind of miraculous when you think about it. And so, you know, good things do happen. But um, I guess when I look at what happened to Jeremiah and to the people Israel around the year 600 BC, which is what we're talking about in today's first reading. And then I look at like the wars and everything that happened in the 20th century. I say to myself, you know what? Human beings have remained pretty much the same throughout this time. You know, I mean, we're, we're really not, like it, it, not all that different. Our technology is different. I mean, like I'm really enjoying this air conditioning right now. Um, I was complaining uh, the other day when it was too hot in my room, and that was too hot while the air conditioning was, was running. Um, but you know what? So our technology is really great, and yet at the same time, uh, we aren't all that much wiser than we were before. Um, wisdom is not something that accumulates through the ages. Wisdom is one of those things that has to be learned anew by each human individual. Um, Otherwise, uh, you know, and so it's up to parents and grandparents to share their wisdom with kids and their life experience because there's no replacement for um, experience and having people who can teach you well in the middle of experience. And the reason I bring this up is because we have as Christians what we call the virtue of hope. Um, hope is, you know, just in general, you, you know what it feels like to be hopeful. It's that you, you look at the future and you say, you know what, the future's going to be better than it is today. You know what, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to have a future where my children are not going to have to grow up with X, but that we will um, have advances in civilization so much that we're not going to have X. And you know what, it's, hope is not a bad thing. I don't want to say that at all. I don't want to say that the future, you know, that there's never going to be any progress in anything, because that's, that's not true. You can look at actual progress that has been uh, that has happened. I mean, you look at the United States. I mean, we had slavery, now we don't have slavery. With all the problems we have, that's progress, no matter how you look at it. And yet, at the same time, um, with human nature, what our, our Lord kind of tells us um, when we look at uh, human history and we see the same faults repeating themselves over and over and over again, is that the Christian virtue of hope is not hope in the things of this world. It's not hope in human progress. It's not hope that we're going to create a better city, a better civilization, and that tomorrow is necessarily going to be better than, um, than today is. Um, that's not the Christian virtue of hope. Not in the least bit. As a matter of fact, our Lord says on many different occasions things that prove to us in a roundabout way that hope is not of things in this world. Take one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, the mind has not so much conceived of what God has prepared for those who love him. That's a beautiful verse. It's telling us what heaven is going to be like, and that's awesome. But the bad news, the opposite side, which is hidden behind that passage, is that if eye has not seen and ear has not heard and the mind has not, not so much as conceived, that world is not this one. I mean, just that, that's, that's true. I mean, all of us Christians believe that that world is not this, this one. With all the human hope, which is a good thing, which we can actually create, um, you know, progress in different ways, shapes and forms, it's never going to be heaven, and there's always going to be major problems with it. The Christian virtue of hope is centered on the fact that we have been offered something which none of us deserve. No one of us deserves heaven. 
Your deeds, no matter how good you are, no matter how generous you are with your neighbor, no matter how many times you've helped um, you know, the landlady take out her garbage, no matter how good of a person you are, the fact of the matter is, is that your deeds do not deserve heaven because heaven is something which is above our nature as human beings. It's kind of like if I, you know, we're looking at a colony of ants, you know, and I'm looking at the colony of ants. And let's say, you know, um, I have a, uh, you know, uh, had a, a good friend who their child really, really loved ants. I mean, they would just look at ant hills. They would have like the ant farms in their house and they knew all the different kinds of ants. And they were just so fascinated with ants, knew everything about them and spent a lot of their time, at least for a portion of their life, looking at these ants. And yet that little boy never considered himself friends with those ants. Because friendship is something that has to happen between equals. And no matter how much this boy took an interest in ants, he was always going to realize that the ants are down there and we're up here. But the th fact of the matter is, is that when you think about our relationship with God, is you think about, you know, God might be taking an interest in human beings, but in reality, are we anything compared to God but just mere ants? I mean, is friendship with God really possible? And the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at it outside of Christianity, the answer is, of course not. Of course you can't be friends with God. That's ridiculous to think that you can be on the same level of God as God and you can enjoy friendship with him. That's absurd. But what ended up happening with Christianity and the Good, good news, the shocking news, is that where there was this huge gap between God, both in our holiness and our dignity, just in the kind of beings that we are, what God did was that God descended from his throne on heaven, and he took on our human nature. It's only because Christ became one of us that you are capable of friendship with God. That's something that you are being offered that had nothing to do with how good you are, it had nothing to do with how far humanity had progressed up till that point. That was a free gift from a generous God that allowed you to enter into friendship with you um, by bringing himself down to your level. But Christianity says, but wait, there's more. Because our God has told us that by entering into our human nature, and forgiving us our sins, and placing his Holy Spirit within you, which is transforming you slowly and surely into a God, which is uh, into the image of God who is capable of loving just a modicum of, of the, uh, as much as he is, to be able to have in a small bit the infinite love of God, that you and I in that way are capable of being equal to God, and if equal to God, then friends with God himself. That's something, again, that is a hope which is not of this world. It is a hope which is beyond anything that this world has to offer. And brothers and sisters, when I look at that hope and I think about how magnificent that is, that you are being offered friendship with God, whereas the rest of the world would think that that's absurd of a human being trying to befriend a bunch of ants. That is the promise that God has made to you and to me. And that, my friends, is Christian hope. That something which was beyond your capability of ever even imagining that it was being offered to you, that it was in your grasp, is suddenly found within your grasp. And that, my friends, that is Christian hope. So yes, when you, um, when we talk about the virtue of hope, that we're going to have a better tomorrow for this world, I don't want to rule that out for us. That's possible. In the end, human nature is going to remain very much the same, so we need to temper what our expectations are. But if you see an injustice in the world, by, by all means, fight against it. As a matter of fact, as a Christian, you have an obligation to fight against it. But realize that the better world that we are working for is not the world, this world here, because eye has not seen, 
ear has not heard and the mind has not so much conceived of what God has prepared for us. Even if we created the best world possible here on earth, it would not even be, heaven would still not be conceivable at that point. So spend your life, your energy, your effort working to make yourself worthy of the kingdom of God. And by worthy, I don't mean that you are somehow better than everybody else. What I mean is that take that Holy Spirit that's within you and transform with his help yourself into somebody who is going to be able to be happy and holy in heaven itself. Let us stand and offer our prayers and petitions to the Lord. We pray for our Holy Father and all the bishops in union with him. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those holding public office, that they may use their authority for the common good. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all of us gathered here. We pray that this day, whatever God is asking us to do, whatever suffering he asks us to endure, whatever joys he sends our way, that we may give thanks to him and do all things for his glory. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the poor, the sick, and the dying. We pray especially for those who will die this day. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we offer you these, our prayers and petitions. We ask you to hear and answer them if they be in accord with your will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the offerings which we bring from the abundance of your gifts, that through the powerful working of your grace, these most sacred mysteries may sanctify our present way of life and lead us to eternal gladness. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, the Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him you have been pleased to renew all things, giving us all a share in his fullness. For though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself, and by the blood of his cross brought peace to all creation. Therefore, he has been exalted above all things, and to all who obey him has become the source of eternal salvation. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. And giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when the supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Robert, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. Live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say the word and my soul shall be.
the prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you have already come and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. We have consumed, O Lord, this divine sacrament, the perpetual memorial of the passion of your Son. Grant, we pray, that this gift, which he himself gave us with love beyond all telling, may profit us for salvation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks be to God.